Billy, what's up, my man? How you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing good. Good. Can you please briefly introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is uh, Billy Krimmel. Um, I'm the owner of Mirror Day. We're primarily a landscape architecture and construction company out of Sacramento. We do native landscaping, a lot of residential, um, some public, tribal work also. Um, we also have a mobile nursery, which you see behind me right here. So this is a native plant truck that um, we use to get native plants out into do-it-yourselfers gardens, primarily by showing up in their neighborhoods and having them invite their neighbors over. And then we also run a nonprofit that uses native gardens as an opportunity for research and for STEM education. So um, I'm very interested about this mobile truck and we'll talk about your practice, but let's start here. And the first thing I want to know is this truck a viable business option? Does it make a profit or is it like more altruistic or is it a hybrid? Like how do you, how does it work? Yeah, so the, the core values of the truck are to get native plants out into the world, uh, to have fun and to break even. Um, so, you know, our design build business is like the one that makes the money, um, but we wanted to serve do-it-yourselfers that didn't have access to native plants. And in Sacramento, when we launched, there was no retail nursery that sold native plants. And so we launched the truck as a way to just get native plants out into the world. Um, but it, yeah, it self-sustains, it makes a little bit of extra money, pays for its own improvements and stuff like that. What about the, I mean, marketing and branding, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think a lot of people actually know us um, by the truck more than they know us by the design build. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, and there is some money that's made and actually all goes into the nonprofit. Okay, yeah. And so you are design build. So how did you get started and um, yeah, how did you get started in design build? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm kind of an outsider by training. So like when I came into it, I didn't even realize that I guess like design build was kind of the rare piece of it. Um, so my background's in ecology. I did my PhD in ecology at UC Davis. I studied plant insect evolutionary ecology, which is like really kind of telling untold stories about nature. And then when I started putting the plants I was studying in my own backyard, I got super excited about the idea of like enhancing gardening through like highlighting these plant insect co-evolved interactions. Um, and that kind of started the ball rolling on me getting into landscaping. And I got my contractor's license um, and then dropped out of a postdoc. Uh, and um, hired some people and just kind of got going and kind of learned how to build the projects on the spot, um, worked with some designers, um, definitely did not have like a well curated aesthetic at that time, was kind of messy about it, but worked with the de designers to kind of reel me in. That's good, that's good. And um, so do you do like hardscape as well or just planting? Yeah, we do everything now. Yeah, so we've got right now, um, I have four full-time landscape designers, four full-time uh, builders, um, project manager, we have a nursery manager, there's me, um, and then sort of a bunch of part-time staff on the, on the mobile nursery, and all the full-time people are salaried, so we're all very much part of the same team. Do you have like land, like are you, are you growing some plants yourself too, or is it a storage flat, I would imagine? For staging, do you, ha what's that? Do you have a solution for that? Yeah, so we have a one acre site in West Sacramento um, and that's like our construction yard. So we keep equipment and supplies out there. And then we also have kind of recently a like maybe 3000 square footish um, shade house and a greenhouse. And so a lot of what we do with the mobile nursery is we just buy wholesale and we sell retail. And again, just to meet the need of the, the lack of retail native plants in the Sacramento area. But um, we now have a full-time uh, kind of facilities nursery person. And that's been really fun because when he has downtime, you know, he can go off and get seeds and get cuttings and start to, we really want to start to offer plants that are not really available on the market that are like important ecologically, but hard to find commercially. There's a ton of annuals that we would love to offer as like potted plants, like tarweed is my favorite. Um, there's a bunch of different species of it. There's um, more like perennial shrubs that could work well. Like there's Yerba Santa, which, is sometimes available through super specialized offerings. Um, uh, but there's, yeah, there's a number of them. Yeah, I mean, so might as well start with, uh, you know, this is one that's pretty familiar. It's a uh, salvia. This is um, salvia clevelandii. And um, so the salvias are, you know, really nice perennial shrubs, um, really nice flowers. They have a nice fragrance. And yeah, you can touch the leaf and smell it. I love doing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, and a lot of the California natives have these like really nice fragrant leaves. And um, 
so the, like, that's something that I actually studied a lot was these like leaf odors and they, they come from these plant hairs that are called trichomes and they're the ones that produce odors are glandular and they produce like oils and resins. And when you touch them, the little like droplets kind of oxidize and they produce these wonderful fragrances that are used to communicate from the plant to insect, from the plant to other plants. Um, na native bees that'll dig little holes in the ground to nest, they'll harvest some of these oils and they'll mix it with the soil to make like kind of a concrete like mud. And they will put their little egg and the little pollen and nectar provision there and then make a little wall and keep doing that. And the oils and resins are really important to keep like parasites from getting into that. Yeah, it's kind of like a structural part. And so, yeah, it's like one of these things that we like to talk about with, with plants is a lot of what you can see and touch and smell has actual consequences ecologically. So bush lupin's another fun one. Um, these are, you know, native shrubs. They do better with like absolutely no water than with extra water. Um, really nice uh, flowers again. Um, they're the host plant for um, these fuzzy woolly bear caterpillars that'll come through and they'll defoliate them and you can sometimes see them like marching over roads along the coast. They also have at night these things called extrafloral nectaries which means that they produce little droplets of nectar um, not on the flower but like around the leaves and um, if you watch them at night like on the coastal range there'll be ants that come up and they'll drink the nectar and that's an adaptation by the plant to like provide resources for these things that'll protect them from caterpillars and aphids and things like that. Very cool, very cool. Do you incorporate lots of swales and mounds into your designs? Definitely bioswales. We definitely try to retain any rainwater and we're, you know, we're in Sacramento, so um, it's really important to try to keep that water in the soil and replenish our aquifers and prevent it from going out into the delta. It's also good for the soil pH. Um, and we do some topography. I mean, Sacramento tends to be, you know, historically pretty flat, like a floodplain. And so we try to respect that kind of typology, but certainly water retention and kind of light topographical interventions. And what do you plant in a swale? What are your favorite plants to plant, like at the, at the lowest and then on the banks? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, definitely like the classic one for structure is juncus. You know, that gives a lot of structure and we'll use that, you know, because we try to be kind of a modern aesthetic, but with, you know, wild fauna or flora. Um, but then there's some really fun ones. I love um, seat monkey flower. And that's an annual that kind of comes up when it's wet and dies back and comes up. And so it'll disappear in the summer, but then in the, in the rainy season, once there's rain, it pops right back up. It's yeah, it's yellow. Yeah. Yeah, and the monkey flowers are just really fun. Like the scarlet monkey flower is fun for swales too. Um, and there's a bunch, like even things like um, woolly sunflower or, or fuchsia. You know they just are a little happier with a little extra water and there's sometimes we'll do like a kind of more subtle one where we'll use like sedges like carex and they just kind of fill in and it's a little bit you know we don't always want to do that like rocky dry creek sometimes it's nice to have it be a bit more of like a kind of subtle water retention strategy yeah so one thing that we've been doing on the design build side of the business um, is trying to do more of our own um, kind of custom fabrication so we built these really cool like magnifying glass stations for a project that's like kind of school garden project where you can take like a leaf and you can put it there and these beautiful like wood and steel um, fabricated installations and you can you know look at the leaf in detail and well that's cool like that. how do you prevent fires it has a little lid that closes okay. <laughs> and then they're also all angled to the north okay <laughs> um, yeah, that was definitely a consideration. <laughs> yeah. um, we we're also buying a laser cutting machine, which oh, is cool. exciting. So we've been doing more of these like wayfinding signs and like kind of um, wood engraved artwork. Um, so like we're really into collaborations with artists. Um, and then on the, the nonprofit side, we have a project that's in its um, kind of third year of piloting that we're really excited about. It's called the Seed Pile Project. And the idea is to learn like what species of native plants can thrive in the urban setting and particularly along transportation corridors, like sidewalks and roadsides and bike paths. And the idea is like, there's some species that are too messy for a garden or just don't do well in a garden setting, but for some reason thrive in these like super harsh conditions. So we have this project collaborating with UC Davis where we give participants uh, three packs of native wildflower seeds that each have like six species in them. And they just dump them on the side of the sidewalk, bike path, somewhere along their commute. Um, we have um, bus drivers doing it along their bus stops. And then they use our app that we made and they tell us what they see, what, what survives. We have resources to help them identify the seedlings. Um, we have modules to help teachers use this as a tool for their classrooms. Um, and then the participants take it through spring until about May. And then we pass their data and it's all got GPS locations. 
um, to entomologists at UC Davis, who then put their own GIS layer on it with um, heat extremes, and then they send their technicians out to study pollinator ecology on them, and they look at like how climate change is impacting extreme heat sinks in urban areas and how that impacts plant pollinator ecology. That's really cool. <laughs> we're excited about it, and we're, we're piloting it. There's a lot to learn about just conducting a citizen science experiment, but we think it's something that's like scalable beyond our region and beyond California. Sounds like you're a busy man. <laughs> you know, we try to come up with cool ideas and kind of let the, the business part follow. And what, I think that's yeah. always been a philosophy. Sure. And so what motivates you? From the beginning, it's been kind of two things. It's been um, telling stories about nature and engaging people in nature, and particularly in human-occupied spaces. And then it's just like, how do we create a world that humans can enjoy and that a biodiversity of nature can thrive into. And that's where I get excited about, like we already have a heavy hand in the spaces that we live in. And so I just get excited about doing habitat restoration and getting people to view these spaces as nature, as opposed to like these wild, pristine areas. And so that's really what we're all about is creating habitat and engaging people in that within the human occupied space. Is there ever a time when not to use native, but climate appropriate? I mean, I'm definitely a believer that you don't have to be 100%. So like, if, it, if you have a client that really wants an agave, give them an agave. Um, I'm definitely not a believer in we should plant stuff from Australia in California because the climate in California is gonna be like Australia's climate. I think that's, to me, a regressive way of thinking about it. I'm, all, I'm much more about let's increase the genetic diversity to facilitate faster adaptation to a changing climate as opposed to like trying to guess what's going to happen and get a step ahead of nature. To me, that just seems like we're not going to do that right. So I think the more we can like buy nursery plants that are propagated from seed, that have known genetic origin, that comprise a, a, a much more vast genetic diversity, I think that will allow our, our systems to evolve better than trying to guess what's going to happen. Excellent, excellent. And then do you give talks to universities? Yeah, I, there's a bunch of classes like at UC Davis, like from landscape architecture um, classes and some American River College and stuff like that. Um, and some other universities, mostly landscape architecture right now. Um, I think there's a lot of interest right now in the field and hearing from people that kind of start with ecology. Is it? Yeah. So this is an Azuzu. Uh, Azuzu. Okay, nice. I think it's a 2001 NPR. Okay. So it's a V8 gas truck. Um, this is a classic like produce delivery truck sure. in the Bay Area. And um, I bought it uh, for $8,000, found it on Craigslist. Uh, it was uh, graffiti covered, 140,000 miles on it, pretty dented up. Nice. Um, some bad fuses, the taillights weren't really working. <laughs> sure. Um, I took a yeah, I trained to the bay um, with an envelope of cash and came back with the, with the truck. Um, yeah, it's so like originally I'd wanted to have a brick and mortar nursery and then kind of step back from that thinking about the reality of, of running a, a seasonal brick and mortar business. And so decided on this, this kind of like, originally my vision was an ice cream truck of plants where we'd kind of cruise through neighborhoods with a jingle yeah, on sure. Sundays yeah, yeah. and like people would flag us down. <laughs> um, and that's since evolved um, into something where people host us in their neighborhood and then they invite their neighbors and we stay there for like four hours and it's more of like it takes some time to kind of unfurl the truck sure. and then it's worth our time because there'll actually be co people coming through. Um, but yeah, so we got it and then me and my team kind of came up with an aesthetic for it. So we put it into a computer program and kind of came up with this general aesthetic for it. And then, um, yeah, then we actually did all the fabrication in-house ourselves. Right. I like that it unfolds and it's shelves, right? And then yeah. you have to... So uh, what, you said the unpacking process is how long? Well, it doesn't take too long. I mean, so, you know, you go on the inside of it and, you know, these guys are all, of course, in. So you let them down. Um, there's those um, uh, gas... I forget what they're called. Um, uh, hydraulic shocks or? They're just like gas struts. I think oh, gas, struts, gas yeah, struts okay, sure. Mm -hmm. On the top that hold the, the, those upper flaps up. They're really heavy. Yeah. Like those things are like 120 pounds each or something oh, like wow. that. Oh, wow, yeah, so you need those. Yeah, yeah. you need the gas struts. Um, you know, it takes maybe 20 minutes. Okay. Um, but so like for events, you know, like we're at the ASLA conference and 
you know, the other vendors will spend six, eight, ten hours setting up their events, yeah, yeah. and we're done in half an hour easily. <laughs> That's um, cool. Uh, but because we kind of need that just to be able to show up for an event at someone's house, and you know, it starts at nine, we get there at eight thirty, and we're ready to go. Uh, but yeah, the fabrication was was really interesting. I mean, we started you know cutting these um, these boxes, and the whole truck just yes, because tilted. it's a. Uh Structural, yeah. yeah so, yeah, and yeah. we, you know, it's not like we had experience doing this. Like right. We really just like yeah. hit it with angle grinders. You yeah. know, we put some chalk lines down where we were cutting and just kind of <laughs> angle grinded it, and then it just sure, sure. And so then we straightened it up and we reinforced it with a bunch of steel tubing. Yeah. Uh, the top originally had fiberglass, and we replaced it with expanded steel mesh and a bunch more steel tubing Let's to get reinforce some light it in there. Yeah. yeah, and that way, and the idea too is that we quickly realized that unloading all the plants and loading them back in was a whole ordeal. So we wanted to be able to keep plants in there kind of full time, but just sort of swap out the ones that sure. need to get a little more love with ones that are a little more pretty. Yeah, and then and do you have like a like a pump action water system? So even or? more than that, we actually have solar panels okay. and then we have a water tank and a, like a big like semi truck battery um, and then a little um, pump and a switch. Mm -hmm. So we have a, an irrigation system for the plants. We can also plug it into a hose. So when we go back to the shop, we just run sure. a hose to it. Yeah. And when we're on the go, we can irrigate it. And then it also has a mister system for the summer. Oh, cool. Off those upper doors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then we have a little custom jingle that's recorded from um, insect sounds and like oh, plant sounds cool. and bird sounds that we play. Cool. That's on a loop. Um, and then also the the pump and the tank allows us to use a hose. We can like rinse off things and hand water as we yeah, want to. Yeah, well. sure. Yeah. I say if you ever upgrade your truck, there's probably uh, some stoner that would love to <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> take over this truck. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and this thing, like, I mean, I've seen some other, like, similar, kind of similar things, like some ones that do like produce trucks at farmer's markets. And they there's can one in Vegas like, called the succulent truck. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if they open up. I've seen like some that'll open up, and I've I've heard of them costing like eighty plus thousand dollars, and right. we did ours for about twenty all yeah. in, um, and we did all the graphics. We had it wrapped, okay. But you know everything, all the cutting, the welding, the the black base paint, the graphic design. We did all that in house. Yeah, and then um, what was the learning cur curve driving it? It's not too bad. I mean, the, the drive back from Oakland was the hardest because I had actually left my cell phone at a Sacramento Kings game the night before. Nice. And so I didn't have like my GPS and oh. I'm really bad at like directions. Yeah, so me I was too. driving through like downtown Oakland with this sure. thing and like not knowing where I was going. Yeah. You figured um, it out though. I figured it out. Yeah. And there's, you know, a lot of blind spots, but eventually you put the blinker on and if you're in doubt, you hit the horn and sure. give it a second. And, yeah. And great, go. great, great. Well, this is a great story. I think it's, it's very inspiring as well um just like just non-traditional thinking for solutions that we desperately need um to incorporate more native plants and education advocacy it seems like you're covering a lot of different bases yeah yeah thanks what would you know if somebody was to ask you what does success look like for this project what would that what would that be for this project in particular, success is, I really think it's getting the native plants out into the world, having fun and breaking even. We've found that we can use it in other ways. Like it's a really good tool, for example, for school gardens. So if a school wants to plant a school garden, they host the truck and people buy a plant for the garden. Point. Yeah, and, and we've been able to use it in a lot of creative ways like that. It also, it's such a community builder, like this model of people inviting us to their house and inviting their neighbors. It's, and so we launched it in, May 2020. Okay. So this was like peak COVID. Sure. Everyone wanted to garden, but everyone was afraid to go to buy plants at the store. Um, and that was, we like, we kind of had it mostly ready in, in March. And then it was like, we got to get this thing going. And we fast tracked it. And it was just like, people were in tears about how they hadn't seen their neighbors and they hadn't been outside around other people. Um, then there was like the whole social justice protest. And so like, you know, like we were hosted by, you know, like black churches and like it just, it became this like community building opportunity to like have events outside and celebrate life, celebrate the future in a time when it was like just really dark and glum. And, um, and even now, like I host it every year and I meet new neighbors every time. And a lot of people will turn it into a party and they'll have like a, a keg of beer and some wine and like snacks yeah. and invite their, their friends and family over. You know, like, I think it's safe to say that like music is a unifier of people 
Um, but I think plants are as well. And I, yeah. I think that we just don't even really know it. But once, once we're given that opportunity and a stage is set, then now you can unify people with, with plants because it's something that we understand by our nature. Like we might not be able to articulate it as well as you, particular plants, but there's something about the plants that we love and we enjoy, yeah. whether it's just aesthetic or fragrance and um, life, like the representation of life. Yeah. I think like optimism for the future. Yeah. Yeah. And one of my favorite things to do is like when I go to a nursery is ask them which plants are throwing away. Yeah. And then just grab those. And they're usually pretty fine. Yeah. And then just revitalize those. Yeah. So. Well, and the, the retail setting is just kind of funny because, you know, we do like the design build and then we do retail and everyone wants to buy the plant and flower for retail. It doesn't matter as much for design build because you're specifying plants for season round interest. And if you plant in fall, you're going to be planting stuff that looks kind of wimpy in fall, but it'll look good in the spring. Whereas mm -hmm. retail setting, this is going to sell. Faster, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> unless, unless somebody knows what it's going to yeah. be. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and certainly some people come with a checklist of plants they want, but with the mobile nursery, like, you know, most of our customers are not like native plant people. Right. They're just kind of people that want to host a plant sale in their, in their yard. So do you then curate knowing, or like, are you kind of starting to understand your audience? Like, so you're curating the plants that you're going to put that you think like I guess your inventory is it curated yeah it, well so we work a lot with like the wholesale nursery in our region cornflower farms and they help us out a lot to just like kind of what looks good it's really a lot about like what's going to be looking the best at that time um, and so we're always pushing native plants it's more about like if we have an, a, a big event in a certain area we might curate plants that'll do really well in that region um, and what's cool about the, the mobile nursery too is with the neighborhood model is we can give people a lot of specific advice to their neighborhood and their needs. And they'll even say like, oh, I live in that house over there. There's that big elm tree. Do you have any ideas? And right. they'll say, oh yeah, like check out these four plants. They'll yeah. do well there. So, okay, there's a lot of plants that move through your hands. Yeah. Given through your design build, through your mobile nursery. Um, what is your inventory process? Is it an Excel sheet? Is it just on the fly? Like how do you manage yeah, how do you manage the inventory? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. It's super <laughs> dynamic. I mean, because with the design build, we have our shade house and we use it as sort of a staging area. So we get deliveries there. And anyone who works in this business knows that no matter how much you follow through with your wholesale provider, and I won't name names, you don't know what to expect in the delivery day. Yeah. Um, and so we like to get the deliveries a little bit in advance and have a chance to fill in the gaps. Yeah. Um, and so that has a totally different inventory system than our mobile nursery one. And we now are part of um, uh, California Bloom, or Bloom California, which is a native plant society okay. campaign where um, we're trying to keep track of which species of native plants we sell and have like performance metrics. And their goal is to boost by 20% by like marketing support certain species. So we now do keep track of the specific plants we sell. Initially we didn't, it was just how many one gallons and five right, gallons. Right. Um, and that is, and to be honest, like so Grace, who runs the mobile nursery, has a system that I'm not sure. totally yeah, yeah, yeah. aware of. <laughs> That's fine. Because if it's working, it's fine. It's working, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, so we're like primarily residential. So our, our yeah. projects usually have a pretty quick turnaround, like usually two to four weeks. Okay. Um, so we have, when we get larger projects, and we just recently had one like with a tribal community that we had a lot of time to prepare for and also involved, then the, we really wanted to have stuff with like specific genetic origin that was from the site, the like tribal land that we were gonna be planting in it. So for projects like that, we will have seed collected and propagated out and planted. Um, but for our typical projects, we just place an order. Um, if we have an, a high enough number of like large trees, we'll go out there with the client and we'll, we'll tag sure. them. Um, That's my favorite part. It's fun. It's, it's, it's really the fun. It's part. fun. It just has to be kind of a high enough budget project to justify the time, you know? Yeah, yeah. All right, Billy, here's the question. Ready? Yeah. Okay. If you were a plant or a tree, what plant or tree would you be and why? Can I do like one of each? Yes. Okay. Perfect. That's yeah. exactly what I wanted to yeah. do. I mean, I'll just do my, my, two, my favorite of each, like okay. Valley Oak, 
Okay. Uh, it's a you know California Valley native oak, biggest oak in the world, I think. Um, Is it protected? Uh, big ones are. Yeah. Once they get to a certain size, okay. they are. Uh, we'll have like thousands and thousands of like insects in them. Birds will migrate through them. I mean, if you want to like have an immediate high impact on biodiversity, plant a valley oak. They grow. They last for hundreds of years. There's gorgeous, gorgeous trees. What's the growth rate on those? If they're in full sun, they get pretty big. I mean, I planted one in my yard seven years ago, and it's 30 plus feet tall. Wow. Yeah, and, and if you plant them in the shade, they kind of go slower, but they're, it doesn't require that much patience. And okay. they eventually, you know, once they're 60, 100 years old, they're just- And they're hardy? Epic, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're great. I mean, I wish that the cities in the valley would only plant like valley oaks for shade trees. I don't know okay. why they deal with these like European elms and right. maples and stuff, to yeah. be honest. So you picked the valley oak, and does that kind of match your personality as well? Like lots of insects, lots of information around you, and like activity, like yeah. do you like, it seems like you like a lot happening around you. Am I reading that correctly? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, lots of action, lots of activity, <laughs> just like full of life, I and mean, they're like, kind of like raggly and like, yeah. In, I mean, my absolute favorite plant's tarweed. Okay. And I talked about that a little bit before. Sure. And like, that was when I was, um, and I still am publishing on it academically. And okay. Like, it's just the coolest plant. It's, um, so it's super important ecologically, like in the late summer, fall in California, it's like the last thing that's green. So it's, it's huge for bees at that time of year. The seeds were a staple crop for a lot of indigenous groups. They're like highly nutritious, kind of like a little sunflower seed without the shell. Um, then what I studied was it's, it's sticky and it smells kind of like tar, really like buttery lemon and it catches little flies in it that just kind of land to like take a little break and then they never leave. And those corpses then are fed upon by baby predatory bugs, like assassin bugs, when they're too small to hunt and then they get big enough and they start hunting the caterpillars that are trying to eat the tarweed plant. Yo. So it's like feeding this like troop of defenders and like I published like a bunch of papers on this. Right, um, right. And the tarweeds also... They're little annual plants, but they evolved into the Hawaiian Silver Sword Alliance. Mm. So like a single seed or a couple of seeds was like brought by a bird from like California to Hawaii. And it evolved into like these like tropical trees and these like volcanic shrubs. And it's just like the coolest plant. Are plants and trees sentient? I mean, absolutely. Like, I mean, they, 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 I mean, if you think about like what is an emotion, what's a memory, it's like behaving different based on an experience and like they absolutely do that. Um, a plant and tree will behave totally different based on its upbringing. Um, you know, they communicate like even like, you know, caterpillar bites the plant and it releases a mixture of saliva and like its own molecules into the air and warns its kin. You know, they'll actually communicate better with their kin than with non-kin. Mm. And then that causes those plants to like up their metabolic defenses against those things. Like, absolutely. Yeah, one, th one thing that I struggle with as a, as a designer is I'm frequently asked to, for aesthetics, design plants that are independent from each other. And I feel like it's a disservice to them because it's like I'm removing them from a community. Yeah. And... I always wonder, is it breaking the plant's heart? You know, like, I don't, I don't know. Is it, is it lonely in that case when it's evolved for millions of years to be part of an ecosystem? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. You know, I, I, the way I think about it is like, maybe it's not lonely, but it's confused. Mm. You know, like, I feel like there's probably not sad plants, but there's plants that are like, confused. Okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. Uh, any closing thoughts? Um, I don't know, you know, plant native. And um, if anyone wants to replicate this, I'm always happy to share. We're not trying to like turn this into a franchise corporation and definitely happy to share information on how to do this yourself.